All right, good afternoon. All right, it's good to see you all. Uh, it's, a, it's a joy for me to be able to introduce once again uh, our, our guest uh, lecture for the Barry Lectures is Dr. Bobby Kelly. And uh, Dr. Bobby Kelly, uh, is, is a, as we've learned this morning, is no stranger around here. He's from the Middlesbrough area and uh, is a Clear Creek graduate. Uh, Dr. Bobby Kelly is, is uh, also on faculty at, at Oklahoma Baptist University. He joined there in 1997. He was named the Rowena Strickland Professor of the Bible in 2000. And in 2004, he was named the Ruth Dickinson Chair of the Bible. He received his Ph.D., in New Testament studies from Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary in Fort Worth, Texas in 1998, where he also served as a teaching fellow there for three years. Uh, re received his Master of Divinity degree from Southwestern Seminary in 92 and his bachelor's degree from Clear Creek in 1988. He, um, Dr. Kelly contributes articles frequently to the Biblical Illustrator, as well as dictionary articles and presentations at, at professional conferences. More importantly, he is married to his wife, Angie, of 26 years, where they have two children together, uh, Luke and Levi. And uh, it's good for him to be back here at campus. This is, this is home for him. And, and uh, as we enjoyed our chapel service this morning, I know that, that we're going to enjoy our lectures as well. Uh, he, uh, he has a, a huge task ahead of him. We, I know that if you ate over at Kelly Hall, you're probably really, really, really full with the, uh, the fried taters and chicken with ham somehow infused in that and top that off with a big old slice of uh, uh, peanut butter pie. Oh, my goodness. Uh, but, hey, he, he can do it. If anybody can do it, Dr. Kelly can do it. So, brother, uh, allow me to pray for you, and then you come on ahead. Lord, we come to you in prayer. We thank you, God, for this day that you have blessed us with. We thank you, Lord, for Dr. Kelly being here. I pray that you just bless him, anoint him, uh, Lord, uh, during our, our very lectures. And, and, Lord, I pray that we'll just glean as much as we possibly can. We thank you, Lord, so much for putting this together. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Yeah, that's uh, after you eat that much, and I couldn't stop. I was full, and yet the pie was still there. So how many, how many of you all ate over there today? Huh? If you all stay awake, that'll be incredible. Because if I were sitting there, I think I'd be, I'd be dozing off. You remember that story, uh, Luke was, uh, or not Luke, Luke's telling the story in Acts about Paul uh, he's, he's on his way, he's actually going to Jerusalem where he's going to be arrested, but on the way, he's making a few stops, and he stops, uh, and he's, he's lecturing and on the second floor, and uh, there was a man named Eutychus that fell out of the window, and uh, ironically, his name in Greek means good luck. He falls, out, he falls asleep, apparently Paul went on too long, and uh, a little long-winded, the man falls out of the second floor window, dead, dead falls dead, and Paul raises him up uh so we're not on the second floor so i guess you're safe but it could could be a story of a uh, cautionary tale well we're back to uh let's talk about parables uh, a little bit and at least this first hour uh, i just i just want to talk about the nature of parables and how we should think about them and then we'll see i, I may uh, talk about the parable of the sower in the second hour that we have so what is a parable um, obviously it's a story now, in the New Testament, there are lots of things called parable that aren't stories. Uh, the New Testament, will, Jesus can say, will a, man, will a blind man lead a blind man? Will they not both fall into the ditch? And that's called a parabole. That's the Greek word that gets translated parable. Um, or even a little comparison that Jesus might make is called a parable. Um, and so it, it doesn't have to be a full-blown story. At its heart, a parable is a comparison of two things. Uh, it's comparative language. So let's think about the, the word parable. I, I already mentioned it's a Greek word. We get our word parable from the Greek word parabole. Para means alongside or by. And the bole word has to do with casting. Like So it's the picture in the word parable is to cast something alongside something else. So the idea is here is something that you want people to understand. It may be really profound, it may be really complex, so it's hard to describe this thing. You can provide a definition, but the definition's not 
probably going to really be able to explain whatever this entity is. The, the, the definition will even be difficult to understand. So what do you do? You say, well, this is like this. Now, if you say this is like a sower who goes out to sow, everybody in that audience anyway would know who a sower is, and they could picture a sower who goes out to sow seed. So there is a way in which the kingdom of God, and that's what you're trying to help people come to terms with, there's a way in which the kingdom of God is like a sower who goes out to sow. You could give a definition of the kingdom of God, which Jesus never does, but that's not, that's not the way he goes about it. He says, here, the kingdom is like this, a sower who goes out to sow. Uh, it's like a very small seed that falls into the ground, like a mustard seed. But then when it, when it grows up, it grows up so large that people can find shade in it and birds can nest in it. And, and they would have been thinking, wow, that's, that's a big mustard plant uh, that can do that. Well, how's that like the kingdom? Or the kingdom is like leaven that's down into, into the dough, and you can't see it until the heat hits the dough and it bubbles up and it starts to expand. And so Jesus talks about uh, the kingdom of heaven is like a rich man uh, who has more than he needs, or the kingdom of heaven is like a man who's going down the road and he gets beat up by murder or by criminals and left on the side of the road to die. So in all these stories, Jesus is saying, the kingdom of God is like this. And that's what a parable is. It, it's comparative language. And I, I would argue in every instance, if Jesus tells a story, at the heart of it, it is to explain something about the nature of the kingdom of God. Now, they're not merely informative. They're not just conveying information. I don't want to reduce them to just giving information. I, I do think that there are ways in which Jesus is actually bringing the kingdom into being. But I don't want to miss the fact that he keeps saying... The kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is like, and then he throws up something that they can understand. So at its heart, that's what a parable is. Uh, as for a definition, I'll give you, I don't, I don't have a stock definition that I use every time, but I have certain components that I want to be in that definition. It is a story. Uh, I'm talking about the story parable. So I'm going to say parable is a story drawn from everyday life, uh, it's going to involve the kinds of uh, scenes, the kind of characters, and the kinds of objects that were part of people's lives every day. Jesus does not use obscure images. He uses images of everyday life. So it's a story drawn from everyday life uh, to announce that the kingdom of God has come. Both by providing information about the kingdom and by bringing it into being through the stories that he tells. Something like that. But I like the image of, here's a parable. What is it like? So I'm, I'm sort of going to do a parable of parables. So as I was talking about, parables are, here's the kingdom of God, and it's like this. That's what parables do. Well, what are parables like? So if parables can be a little difficult to understand, what are some images we might use to say, well, a parable is like this? Well, that's on that uh, handout that was in, in the... It's the sheet that was printed that was in the handout this morning. Uh, I, the first one is one that I thought East, Southeastern Kentuckians could appreciate. And I draw it from Walter Wink in a little article he wrote, Letting Parables Live. He says, they are like tiny lumps of coal squeezed into diamonds. Reminds me of an old country song I, I can still remember. And I'll sing only occasionally, Michael. But uh, I'm just an old chunk of coal. But I'm going to be a diamond someday. Uh, I, I think that's a pretty good a, a explanation of what uh, these stories that Jesus tells. They're, they're like tiny lumps of coal. Sometimes it's a story that might not capture your attention that much. I mean, sometimes it's like a seed that falls into the ground and it's very small, but then it grows up and it's big. I mean, you're not going to pay $8 to go to the movies, to theater, to watch that movie about a seed that goes into the ground and then sprouts up and it's big. These are not all stories that just immediately capture your imagination. Uh, some of them are rather everyday life, mundane kinds of stories. But these what we might think of as tiny lumps of coal uh, actually become diamonds. Um, and, and I know about coal. I grew up on Winchester Avenue in Middlesbrough and the coal trucks ran up and down 
uh, all day, every day, it seemed like coal business was booming when I was a kid, and, and pieces of coal would fly off those, uh, those uh, coal trucks that drove by. We'd pick them up in our yard all the time. Hope he didn't get hit by one. Um, so he says, they're like tiny lumps of coal squeezed into diamonds, condensed metaphors that catch the rays of something ultimate and glint it at our lives. They are jeweled portals of another world. Through their surfaces are refracted light that would otherwise blind us or pass unseen. Here's his way of describing a parable. Here, what is a parable? Well, it's like a lump of coal that is pressed and pressured over time. It becomes a diamond. And that diamond, you can never exhaust the beauty of a diamond. Um, at, at where I teach and, and the students I teach every semester... I will have multiple students who get engaged during the semester. Uh, I've got 50, I think about 56 students in my New Testament class. I've got about 25 in a Gospels class, about 25 in a Hermeneutics class, and about 10 in a Greek class. So you put that number of students together, and uh, they're 18 to 22, and you're going to have a number of them get engaged during the course of the semester. I like it better when I have one of the female the, uh, the people who've been engaged because they've got the diamond. So they come to class on a Monday after I've seen on Facebook or uh, somehow I've seen the video of the whole thing that they've posted on Facebook. That makes it real. You know, if it's Facebook posted, then it's legit. Otherwise, people doubt if it really happened. Um, but they're there on Monday, and I'm, you know, I want to say, hey, congratulations, too. And I say, you want to show us the ring? And oh, my goodness, of course she wants to show us the ring. So you get the, you get the, like this, and oh, and, you know, she wants to show it off to everybody, and you can still, she's still, she's still really in love with this ring that she just received. And the, the thing of that is, you could say, well, you've seen that. You don't need to look at it anymore, right? I mean, you looked at that diamond when he placed it on your finger. You got a good look at it. There's no need to keep looking at it. You know what that diamond looks like. You know the colors in it. No, because the least turn of that diamond and the light will hit it in a different way and you see color you didn't see before. You could never exhaust all the beauty of a diamond. And that's precisely at least one of the ways I want to think about Jesus' stories. I think we've not done them a service because there was a fear that people were allegorizing them. You know what allegory is? It, it, it's sort of like you take a story and you take all the individual elements of it and you turn each individual element into like some eternal truth. And, and you can take a story that seems like it's pretty self-evident on the surface what it's about and turn it into something that no one's ever heard before. Well, I just happen to have a good example of that. I, I, I'm going to use very common illustrations here. You may have heard it. But Origen, the early church father Origen, like most of the early church fathers, allegorized uh, almost any story. I mean, if you had a story that involved three items, it was going to turn into an allegory of the Trinity. Uh, and, and in this case, it's the parable of the Good Samaritan. Now, this is the, the, the great early church father origin. This is the way he interpreted the, what he called the allegory of the Good Samaritan. The man going down to Jericho, that's the one who gets beat up, is Adam. The Jerusalem from which he was going is heaven. Jericho is this world. The robbers were hostile influences and enemies of man, such as the thieves and murderers mentioned by Jesus in John 10, 8. The wounds that the man received, that's, the dis that's his disobedience or sin. So that's Adam's sin. The priest is the law. The Levite is the prophets. Guess who the good Samaritan is? That's Jesus, right. The beast, the animal that uh, the Good Samaritan puts the wounded man on, is the body of Christ. That's the church. The end, uh, or that's the body of Christ. No, that's the actual body of Christ. The end is the church. The two denarii, he says, uh, I'll pay you two denarii if you take care of this man. That's the knowledge of the Father and the Son. The innkeeper, is the, that's the angels in charge of the church. And the return of the Good Samaritan, of course is the second coming of Jesus. Now that's an allegory of the parable of the Good Samaritan. Well, I thought it was about who's my neighbor. And, and so it was this kind of 
for a good part of the church's history, parables were or allegorized. And there's some danger to that because, I mean, what are the controls? Who can say, no, the beast is not the body of Christ or the, the, the end is not the church? There's no, there's no way to determine is that a legitimate interpretation of that or not. And so it led to, in more uh, modern times, a rejection of allegory and the quest for one central truth of the parable. I like that. I, was, I, I cut my teeth on that, that you find the one meaning of the parable. But now here I am, 22 years of teaching, thinking about this for longer than, than, uh, you know, longer than some of you are old, and uh, deciding that might be too restrictive. Now, I'm, I'm never going to open it up and say you can, make the, you, know, you can make any item in the parable some universal truth or that this, you know, I'm not going to do that. And I'm not going to say that it can mean anything you say it means. But neither am I going to say you can only have one meaning of, a, of any story that Jesus tells. And my fear is because we go for the one meaning, because we say you got to find the single meaning of the story, that once you've found that, why the need to keep going back to the parable? If all the parable the Good Samaritan is, is a story about my enemy is my neighbor and I'm to love them, then once I know that, why do I need to keep going back to that story? I already have it. It would be like saying, I've already seen that diamond. What, what I found in teaching this, thinking about this, is that, yes, there might be this overarching idea about my enemy is my friend or, or is my neighbor. But there are more nuances in that story, and you might not realize it when you're 18 years old and you hear that. Maybe at 18, you've got some racism in your heart towards somebody that you go to school with, and this parable helps point it out that even that person is my neighbor and I'm supposed to love them. But maybe you're 30, and maybe you don't deal with that racism anymore, but there's something else that that parable speaks to, and it your life experiences, where you, where, where you go through in life, all these things, for me, is like turning the diamond. And you read that parable at another point in life, having different experiences, having different needs, and you might see something in that story that you never saw before. This is why I like the image of the, of the diamond. Maybe it seems pretty everyday kind of story, like a lump of coal, but... In the, in, on the lips of Jesus and turning over in our minds, it becomes a diamond that can never be exhausted in its full beauty. So I keep going back to them, even ones where I feel pretty solid about, well, there's a, there's a central idea here that's pretty easy to grasp. But I want to keep reading the parable and allow it to impact me in different ways forever. And they do that. And I'm sure you've had that experience. You've gone back to a story that Jesus told, and you think, wow, I never thought of that before, or I ne that never occurred to me when I saw it before. And it might change the way you think about yourself, or God, or your world, or the church. And so I, I think that's valuable, and I think that's part of what a parable is. It's not just a story with a single meaning. I think it, it's more profound than that. And I'm going to talk a little bit later about some ways to avoid allegory, but also be willing to be open more than just a single idea. Second uh, image I have here is weapon of warfare. And I think it's important to think about these parables in this way. These parables are not simply Jesus explaining things. That's too reductionist. That's too minimalist. These, these stories that Jesus tell, they, they are actually part of the weaponry of his warfare. Now, what's evident in the ministry of Jesus is that from the very beginning, he is engaged in a war, in a battle. And you see it uh, in all of the Gospels. Uh, Mark sort of gets to it quickly uh, because Mark doesn't have any birth story. Uh, he doesn't have anything. Uh, right at the beginning, he says, the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And then John the Baptist is coming out of the wilderness. He's baptizing. By verse 14, Jesus is going into Galilee preaching the gospel, saying the kingdom of God has come upon you. In chapter 1, the first miracle that Jesus performs, he's in the synagogue teaching, like opening sermon, first sermon. He's in the synagogue teaching, 
and a demon-possessed person comes in and starts screaming, what do you have to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? And he says, shut up and get out. Not to the person who has interrupted this, this, his sermon, his uh, Barry lecture, not to the person, but to the demon, the unclean spirit that has possessed this person. Opening, one of the opening scenes, first miracle is an exorcism. What's that tell you about Jesus' ministry? That he is in conflict. There is hostility towards him from the powers. And it also becomes clear, you know, who has the power here. Uh, he does. But spiritual warfare is happening every moment of his existence at levels that we could not imagine. So how does he overcome the powers? Well, it, it, it's not just by his death because he already has authority over them. So there's, it's more than just his death and resurrection. There are other weapons that he's employing in his warfare against the powers. And one of those weapons is the telling of stories. And I hope that we never underestimate the power of a story. Um, I think that you can give people commandments. Thou shalt not. And people can dodge a commandment. We find ways around the commandment. You know, like, thou shalt not commit adultery. All right, that sounds pretty, that, there it is. No debate about that. Well, then you've not worked with young people. Because they want to know, well, what constitutes adultery? Uh, exactly how far can I go before I've committed adultery? And of course, anybody who's asking that question is probably up to no good. Um, but we find ways to dodge, thou shalt not murder. Well, I've never killed anybody, so I'm solid there. You know, but then Jesus says, well, it's more than just literally taking their life. What if you have hatred in your heart? Um, but just a sheer commandment, we can, phew, we, we know how to dodge that. But how about a story? Somebody starts to tell you a story, you don't know to put your defenses up. You're listening to the story, you get drawn into the story. Before you know it, you're identifying with a character or characters in the story. Things will happen to you that you weren't prepared for. Have you ever watched a story, heard a story, start to notice your eyes welling up? Tears roll down your cheeks. You're thinking, where's this coming from? You're sitting there in the theater. Maybe, you, maybe if you're like me, you don't want to be like a blubbering idiot uh, when you find out their, their Labrador retriever died in the movie. But here I sit, you know, just tears rolling down my face. Where's this coming from? I wasn't planning on this. I didn't know the dog was going to die. Should have told me that up front. I might have gone out for popcorn at that point in the movie. The stories just have a way to... They sort of lure you in, not deceptively, but they just bring you in, and then you're caught. And a story can impact you in a powerful way, in ways that thou shalt not might not be able to. So what's Jesus doing when he's telling these stories? He's, this is part of his weaponry against the powers. These telling stories wasn't just giving information. This was part of bringing the kingdom into being. Now, I know that's kind of hard for us to understand. How would a story bring the kingdom of God? The announcement that the kingdom of God has come is part of the kingdom of God coming. And part of the way he announces that is when, with his story. Stories are powerful. And I'm saying, what is a parable? It's a weapon of Jesus' warfare. Now, I've got two, two examples of how that's uh, been uh, sort of been worked out. One of them is Eugene Peterson. He's the person responsible for doing the message translation paraphrase uh, of the Bible. Uh, not everybody likes the message, and I certainly wouldn't recommend you using it as a study Bible, uh, but it's a brilliant commentary in my estimation. It's more of a commentary than it is a translation, but he was brilliant, a brilliant translator. Hebrew, he was able to handle Hebrew and Greek, um, he said about parables, and um, he says it in the contemplative pastor, returning to the art of spiritual direction. He refers to Jesus' parables as narrative time bombs. Um, and th the point with that is, you tell a story. Maybe someone is not immediately impacted by it, but they keep rolling it around in their heads. You ever done that? 
You ever heard a story, thought about a story, seen a story, and then you, you rolled it over in your head, and at some point it's like, oh, and, and something hits you, and you understand something, or, or you come to realize something important, uh, like, narr- like a narrative time bomb. They don't always explode immediately. And then what I find a more compelling statement of it is by a man, his name's Roy Clements, in a book called A Sting in the Tail. Here's his quote. He likens the parables to a stealth bomber, specially designed to evade our psychological defenses, insinuating themselves inside our mind in spite of every barricade we may seek to erect, and then dropping a highly explosive charge targeted at the most vulnerable point in our spiritual complacency. And it, it's just the point that I was making. Uh, thou shalt not. We, we can find ways to sort of evade that if we want. But a story, you don't even know that the defenses are up. It's a story. If I start telling you a story about something, you'll just get drawn into it. And before you know it, bam, like a stealth bomber. Now, both Peterson and Clements are pointing to this reality that I, that I want to point to, that they're part of the weaponry of Jesus' warfare. Now, I will, uh, I will strongly emphasize that the strongest weapon that Jesus uses, sort of the nuclear bomb, is the death and resurrection. His telling of stories does not, is not comparable with his... I mean, what he does on the cross is the ultimate in his defeat of the powers. Um, he was nailing them to the cross, in a sense, along with our sins. So I'm not going to make them equal to that act. But it's part of the weaponry, with the climactic event being his death and his resurrection. Um, so I don't, I don't want to overplay this, but I do think they're part of his weaponry of warfare against the powers. And we know that Jesus was caught in uh, this spiritual warfare from the very beginning. Next image. So what is a parable? Well, it's like a lump of coal pressured into a diamond. It's inexhaustible. Uh, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't think that we've solved it when we find a meaning there. We should, we should keep going back to it to see what more beauty we can find. It, what is a parable? It's like a weapon of Jesus' warfare. And the third one, parables are a window. Parables are windows onto reality. Jesus gives us through his stories, the ability to see the world for what it really is. Uh, I can, you can pick any parable and think about it, but the parable of Good Samaritan works pretty well. Um, we get caught in, in this present evil age, people who are fallen and given to tribalism and sort of us against them mentality. It's easy to see certain other groups and this will change depending on where you are, in the, where you are in the country. Uh, you know, this part of the country is not always seen as the most welcoming to strangers. Um, my colleague, Alan Bandy, imagine this, two Clear Creek alums teach at Oklahoma Baptist University. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, what are the odds of that? But Dr. Bandy, um, who graduated, he's, he's about a decade younger than me. He came after I did. Um, but he talks about uh, coming here. His father-in-law came to Clear Creek and recommended he did. He was a little bit later coming to his call to ministry. And uh, they're trying to, they're, he's coming from Maryland, and he's having a little bit of try, time, a hard time finding Clear Creek. Um, didn't have GPS devices. And so he stops at some store to get directions. So he walks in. He's from Maryland. Now, that's Yankee country where you know from my point of view so uh, I don't know where the Mason Dixon line is but it's from my view it's above it he, it's Yankee Yankee country so he comes in and I'm sure with his uh, Maryland accent asks uh, could you guys give me some directions and he said it was two old guys like sitting at a table and I might be I might be making this up because that's the picture I had but I can imagine him sitting there with like a you know like an RC cola with peanuts in it and uh They just look around at him, and one of them says, you ain't from around here, are you? (laughs) And the answer was no, and and I'm not sure he got very good directions from them. But, you know, I I, I think we we sort of grow up recognizing this us against them. And and it can be true from parts of the country. It can be true based on your race. 
It can be true based on economic status. It can be, it can be true based on educational uh, levels. You know, I, I grew up where there was a little bit of a negative attitude towards too much education. Um, I remember getting, I don't know how many times somebody told me when I was talking about going, when I was leaving my church that I'd pastored for two years, Cedar Grove Baptist Church, getting ready to go to Southwestern Seminary, don't let them ruin you. And uh, I, I pretty well knew what they meant by that. Don't let them steal your passion. Don't let them steal your, your de desire to bring people to Jesus. You know, don't let all that learning mess you up. And uh, that reflects some of that attitude towards education that's a little bit of us against them. And we're given to that, right? Um, and so I'm, th I'm talking about now, think about the parable of the Good Samaritan. It's easy to think, these people are my neighbors, people who are like me, people that I'm comfortable with, and not so much those others. And we, we come to believe that's just the way the world works. Jesus tells a story like the parable of the Good Samaritan to say, no, the world that you've come to see is upside down. That's not the way it is or as, as I want it to be. And he tells a story that shows that for what it is. It's a world upside down. We shouldn't have that kind of tribalism. We shouldn't see us against them. We are human beings created in the image of God, every one of us. No matter the color of your skin, whether you're from Kentucky or, or dare I say, Duke University, you know, they play tonight. So I'll use them as the other. But even a Duke student is a human being created in the image of God. I'm willing to go that far here today. And so it forces you to think differently about them and to see the world differently. So it shows you the false image of the world upside down, and it gives you something of what the world should be, looks like right side up, in a world where I recognize that even my enemy is my friend, or even my enemy is my neighbor. Um, so, it, so that's, we need to see the, the reality. We come to believe that the world as it is, is as it will be. And so we learn to play by society's rules, by a fall in society's rules. We come to think there are certain ways to get ahead, to succeed in life. Because that's the way it works in the real world. But you know, in the kingdom of God, it's blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom. That's, that sounds upside down. The first shall be last. The last shall be first. Sit in the last place... And you might get the first place of, of honor. Well, that's not right. That's not the way it works. The world doesn't work like that. If you want to be first, you've got to fight and scratch and claw and take down as many people who are in front of you as you have to. Um, some of you will remember when Charles Barkley was a basketball player, not a commentator. And um, he, Nike did an ad with him. And some of you older folk might remember it, older like me. And the ad was, the meek might inherit the earth, but they won't get the ball. Now, that's the way the world works. If you want the ball, you've got to be assertive. You've got to go get it. That's not the stuff of the kingdom. And so these stories that Jesus tells calls out reality as we've come to know it and says, no, that's upside down. Here's how the world is going to be. Here's what it looks like right side up. Um, when I was a kid, I went to West End Elementary in Millsboro. And uh, the swing sets are still out there. I imagine it's the same swing sets that I swung on when I was a kid. And I, I remember I, could, I was small enough, I could put, lock my legs around that swing I could throw it over the top, lock my knees around it, and swing upside down. And it was an interesting vantage point to see the world swinging upside down. School was upside down. Trees were upside down. Everything upside down. I imagine if you could swing long enough and all the blood not rush to your head and go unconscious, but if you could somehow exist that way, 
you'd come to think that's the way the world is. Trees point down. Uh, building upside down, that's the way it is. Um, but that's not the way it is. It's my upside down viewpoint making it appear that's the way the world is. Jesus' stories come along to say, okay, look, here's a window. I want you to look through this window. Here's the way reality ought to be and will be. Now, do you want to be part of that reality? Do you want to be part of the kingdom or not? It's up to you. So uh, I like the window image. But windows can do, do, serve dual focus. Uh, if you've ever looked out a window at something out there, if the, if the light catches just right, what, what else might happen? You might actually catch some glimpse of yourself. You ever see anybody like fix their hair a little bit in a window? Because there's just enough of an image there of yourself where you can make sure there's no toothpaste in your hair or, you know, something. You're right anyway. You're somewhat together. Um, I think these parables also have the power not only to say something about out there, but they have the power to catch you, to grip you and grip your heart and mind and cause you to realize something that you desperately need to know about some attitude you have that is contrary to God's purposes, about some activity in your life that is harming your relationship to God, and somehow you've tuned all that out. Uh, these windows can become a mirror, and uh, thanks be to God when they do. Finally, parable. How about seed? A parable is like a seed. Jesus likes to use the image of seed. What kind of seed? How about, it's like seeds of revolution. That's what kind of seeds. Jesus is announcing the revolution has come. The world is never going to be as it has been since Adam's sin. The revolution has come. And these stories he tells are sort of the seeds of revolution, spreading them around, kingdom growing up as a result of it. And, and what happens with the announcement, the revolution has come? It's not only an announcement, it's an invitation. Come and be part of it. And I think this helps us, and I'm, I'm going to look at the parable of the sower, if not this hour, the next hour. I think that's very much uh, about it matters how you hear exactly what the parable will do. If you're willing to hear with faith, uh, it can turn your world upside down, or should I say right side up. If you're unwilling to hear with faith, it'll just drive you deeper into the darkness. That's the nature of these, these seeds of revolution that invite you to come and be part of the revolution, or to reject it and find yourself uh, even more in the darkness. So all that to say, well, it's a parable. Well, I can give you a definition. But I don't know if that definition is going to really help you understand what it is. I'd rather say a parable is like. It's like a diamond. It's like a, a, a stealth bomber. It's like a narrative time bomb. It's like a window. It's like a mirror. It's like a seed that has within it the power of revolution. I, I'll tell you, Jesus was dangerous. And I worry. I teach a Gospels class. And I worry if you can just read the Gospels and go away and not see how radical Jesus was. Jesus would have had a very hard time um, getting hired to teach at Oklahoma Baptist University or even getting elected to be pastor, called to be pastor of a church. I'm afraid if people listen to him very much, they say, oh man, he's too radical. He's going to stir people up too much. That's what he did. He's announcing something world-changing. The revolution has come. And so we take this lion that's roaring and, and we turn him into a nice little domesticated house cat who just basically thinks like we do. You know, he, his attitudes are our attitudes. And, and if he happens to roar just a little bit, we'll find a way to pet him a bit until he, he lines up with our politics till he lines up with our theology, till he lines up with the way we view other people. And uh, there's a danger in that. 
And I tell my students, if, if you're able to, in this course, read through the Gospels like we do, look at passages as we're going, and at the end of all this I say, how are you changed by Jesus' teaching and by Jesus' actions? And you can't think of several tangible ways in which His teaching has caught you, convicted you, demanded that you change your life, then I'm not sure we're really listening. Or we've domesticated him so much, we just find a way that he, he is us. And he's not. And I promise you, all of us harbor attitudes as we sit here today that are not in line with the kingdom of God. All of us. We're still part of this present evil age, and we still have a ways to go. And if we just keep reading the Gospels and just finding ourselves not moved very much or not challenged, then... I'm not sure we're really allowing him to speak. We're forcing him into our already sort of preconceived ideas about things, and he's just one of us. Don't do that. All right. Um, I think probably this would be a good stopping point. Uh, I got 1246, so uh, I'll give you, that's a little under, four, that's about 14 minutes, a little under 15 minutes. Oh, let's do that. I got time for that. Okay. How about questions? Look, we got a microphone over here. Uh, if you want to do that, if you want to come to the microphone, I would repeat your question if you just don't feel like getting up. But if you've got a question, I'd love for you to uh, ask your question or raise your hand and I'll repeat your question. Oh, don't be afraid. Come on. Come to me. I won't, no sudden movements. Come on. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, is, is Luke which one? Luke 16? Ah, uh, he's asking, is Luke 16 uh, the rich man and Lazarus story? Is that just a story that Jesus told that, that's not true in the sense that these were real people that actually, and it actually happened in time and space, uh, or did he just make the story up? Uh, my, the quick answer is I don't think there's any reason to think any of his stories were something that he actually witnessed, and so he's reporting on something that he, he saw. Um, I'm sure he saw lots of these parables, um, things work out similar to them, but I, I think they're just stories that he tells. And, and they're rooted in everyday life, but I don't think they're necessarily like with the parable of the sower. That he actually saw a sower one day sowing seed, and he noticed some of it fell you know, on this particular day. Some fell on the path, and some fell here. Uh, I just think that's, that, that's part of just the way he tells the story to make the point. Not that he actually knows of a situation. Was it possible that a man going from, down from Jericho to Jerusalem or from Jer uh, Jer Jericho to Jerusalem uh, had been beaten by robbers? Absolutely. That was known to be a pretty dangerous path to walk. Did Jesus observe a particular event where a man was beaten and then a priest came by and a Levite came by and then a Samaritan? I don't have any reason to think he actually saw that. But it's, it's, it's the it's the story that he tells. So now that's my short answer. I don't think there's any reason to think any of these were Jesus reporting on a specific event that he witnessed. If you ask me, is it true? I would say yes. It's most certainly true um, because it reflects something that is true that he wanted to teach. Um, so I got two answers. Is it true? Yes. Do I think that there's any reason to think that they actually occurred just as he described it? No. Um, I'll probably tell you a couple stories in the next hour, and uh, you tell me if you think it's true or not. You'll know the story when I tell it. That's a good question, though. But for it to be true, I don't think it has to have actually happened. Um, I think Jesus can tell a story and make it up, and it's still true. Got another Go ahead. You almost got one. Was that, were you about ready? No? You still thinking about it?
when is it appropriate to take a story that Jesus told? Yeah. Well, I, I think it, it's as appropriate as any other way we try to address a situation that we see. If we see a situation we think it's not right, it's unjust, or a person needs is going in the wrong direction, we would, tr we would try to address it through all types of means. And I think a story is, a, is just a, one of the ways in which we could do that. And, and it raises a good question about Jesus stories. Um, because I bet he told these stories more than once. I bet he told many of these stories over and over again, maybe changing it a little bit depending upon the audience or the situation. We have most of them only in one of the Gospels. You know, there are only three parables that are in all three Gospels. Just three. Now, John didn't even have parables. But Matthew, Mark, Luke, there's only three parables that are in all three. You want to take a guess what they are? The sower, the sower is one of them. Uh, the, uh, the, if the vine dresser, if by, uh, let, me, let me make you right. The story about the wicked tenants, uh, the, the one where the, the field is rented out, the vineyard is rented out. See, I'm getting, to, I'm getting you partially right there. Uh, but it's rented out to tenants, and then when it's time for the, uh, to collect, they kill the servants that the vineyard owner sends. That one's in all three. So we got the parable of the sower, the wicked tenants, and... It's the mustard seed, small but grows up big. That's the only three. All, uh, most of Luke's parables and almost every one that we're going to look at, with the exception of maybe one, is unique to Luke. So these gospel writers know these stories. Uh, they've become aware that Jesus told stories, but they don't use every story they know. Uh, and they've given them to us here. They've selected some to include, some to exclude. So they made the decision, the gospel writers, Luke did, not to use parables, some of the parables, that, like the treasure hidden in the field. That was not in Luke. I'm sure Luke knew about that parable. I think Luke probably had access to Matthew's gospel. But he chose not to narrate it. Um, and so the way they use the parables, I think, is an important question, or an interesting question. Why did they choose these parables? And why have they uh, included them the way they do? It's a, it's, a, it's a good question. Yes, sir. Uh, that is an important question. Uh, I'm originally from Haiti. Ah, from Haiti. The problem I have seen often happen is when people are using parables, there's a cultural gap. Like, we tell the story and we're like, I don't know what you're talking about. For instance, there was a 10 person. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. And what's your name? Shama. Say it again. Shama. Shama. Yeah. Uh, from Haiti. Yeah. Uh, are, do you, are, are Haitians storytellers? A lot. So, so, there's, so they might be, because I'm not sure uh, we like stories as much as maybe some cultures, so maybe these resonate a little more with a culture that, likes to, that, that really likes to tell stories. But I'm, it's actually an important point that I'm going to talk about in the next session, but I, I do think if the person doesn't get the points of reference in the story, like elements of a Jewish wedding, they're not gonna, the, the parable's not going to have any punch. It's like, it's like me telling you a joke, and you don't get the points of reference. At the end, you're not going to laugh. You don't get the joke. I tell a joke I think is uproariously funny. Let's say I go home, tell my wife a joke that we told around the office. Let's say it involves theology that she's not really that in on. So, I don't know, let's make it a Calvinist joke. Is this being videoed? Well, it's okay. Uh, I, I won't give away whether I am or aren't, but uh, I'll just say uh, Calvinism is a more fertile field for humor. So, uh, did you hear about the Calvinist who fell down the stairs and uh, broke his arm and got a concussion? You know what he said at the bottom? Thank God that's over. Oh, come on, that's better than that. Uh, okay, how about this one? Did you, did you hear about the Calvinist scoreboard maker? He went out of business because the scoreboards told the score before the game. Huh? Oh, come on. 
Okay, now, I'm not telling those to be funny. I'm saying, if I go home and I hear this joke at the office, and I go home and tell my wife, who might not be as interested in Calvinism as uh, people at my office, and I tell her this joke that has to do with predestination, and she doesn't know that's identified with Calvinism, so I tell this joke that I think is funny, and she goes, I don't get it. So what do I do? I explain it. I say, well, John Calvin was. I go into an explanation of Calvin and Calvinism. And at the end of it, when let's say I've explained it all now, will she laugh? Probably not. She might say, oh. And then go on about, that's not what I wanted. I wanted laughter. So you, you do something to the story when you have to explain it. Jesus didn't have to explain the points of reference. Now, sometimes they'd scratch their heads and say, hmm. But it wasn't because they didn't get the elements of it. It was just the kind of story they had to think about. Um, for us, we look at these stories from a culture 2,000 years old. We don't always get the points of reference. We don't, we don't get it. So that's our job, to learn the points of reference as teachers and preachers and then explain that to our people. The problem is you, you don't have the same effect as it would have had with Jesus' audience. So what do we do? I'm, I'm letting the cat out of the bag a little bit here, but I'm going to suggest we, we try to understand what impact that story would have had on the audience, and then we try to tell a story in our own time that would have the same punch. Like modernize the story. Update it to points of reference that people can understand today. Uh, now, that requires first you getting the parable yourself before you can then say, okay, here's a story that I think would have the same impact or similar impact in the 21st century. I'm always going to tell Jesus' story. But you'll notice even in my chapel thing this morning, I had a few stories in there. The Barbara Brown Taylor story about dealing with a person who needed a reason for this tragedy that had happened. I'm going to try to tell some stories that achieve a similar kind of punch. Um, and I'll explain Jesus. I'm going to tell Jesus stories. I'm never going to tell mine over Jesus stories. But I might drop in a, a story that I think would accomplish a similar purpose with my audience today. Well, I think we better take our break. And, and we'll come right back in here at, what, five after? Yeah, because we're going to stop on time. So let's get, go out and come back so we can, we, we'll be done.